Sekiro is an excellent game that not only has a wonderful story but also a unique approach to its storytelling that hasn't been seen in the Soul series before. It's a game that was an enjoyable experience throughout every moment I played and I cannot recommend it enough. As always, welcome back to another story review, the series where I not only discuss the game's story but also critique it along the way. Today's episode is going to be on Sekiro with many more Souls games to come in the near future. If you do want to see some more Souls content, you can also watch my Bloodborne video that I published about a month ago. But with that out of the way, Let's get started. So to no one's surprise, Sekiro, like other Souls games, starts with a cutscene that sets the background for the story. Sekiro takes place in Japan during the Sengoku era. We also learn that there was a rebellion that was started which ultimately led to a victory thanks to a soldier named Ishin Ashina, who was responsible for slaying the opposing faction's leader, General Tamura. After the battle, a shinobi by the name of Owl discovers a child sitting around dozens of bodies and decides to welcome the child into his home. He then trains this young boy in the way of the sword as well as the iron code, which is that the father's word is absolute and the master's word being second in priority. Through years of training and hardship, this child would become a full-fledged shinobi and our protagonist known as Wolf. But something went wrong. Both Owl and his master are gone, so with no purpose in his life, he now just sits at the bottom of a well waiting for a purpose or death whatever comes first. However, one day he receives a note that leads him to the Moonlight Tower, and when Wolf arrives at said tower, he finds Lord Kuro, who is not only the divine heir, but also his master. Kuro needs some assistance. He wants to escape Ashina as the never-ending war that has plagued Japan is slowly making its way back to Ashina Castle, and Kuro wants to leave and run away from what he calls the Faded Bloodline. The two take a secret passage, but are caught by Genichiro Ashina, the adopted grandson of Ishin Ashina. Genichiro wants Kuro. It's unclear why, but he needs him for his plan and won't let us escape. So we fight, and being the skilled shinobi that we are, we have no problem getting absolutely destroyed by him. Genichiro cuts off Wolf's arm, who then collapses from blood loss, while Genichiro takes Kuro away. Somehow though, Wolf was able to survive thanks to an old man named the Sculptor, who is not only able to nurse him back to health, but also give him a prosthetic wooden arm to replace our recently cut off one. From the Sculptor, we learn one thing. Genichiro plans to use Kuro's bloodline for something and we need to get him back, thus setting the game's plot in motion. So already, this is a fantastic start, and this intro highlights many unique design decisions within Sekiro. Firstly, it took six games, what we now finally have a named and voiced protagonist. Sekiro still retains that Souls formula of giving the player a title like Ashen One or Hunter, as in this game we're referred to as the Shinobi of the Divine Heir, but most characters will still call him Wolf. Furthermore, it's evident right from the beginning that this game has a very unique style to its storytelling. Sekiro is a very cutscene and dialogue driven game. Sekiro has a lot of cutscenes and conversations, especially in the very beginning, and many of the game's objectives can be completed without talking to NPCs, as opposed to other games where NPCs were just optional. The story is also quite linear, and this ties into the NPCs as well, as many characters will repeat quest objectives about 4-5 to five times in a couple minutes to make sure the player knows what they're doing, and will also have to report back to these NPCs once the objectives are completed. The Souls games also love to draw inspiration from specific media, and Bloodborne took this a step further by making H.P. Lovecraft and his Lovecraft Craftian stories be the inspiration for the game's plot. And while Sekiro does do this as well, instead of fully embracing the fictional elements of H.P. Lovecraft like with Bloodborne, Sekiro goes in the opposite direction and instead focuses on non-fiction storytelling by using history, culture, and religion. All of these decisions are very bold, especially coming from a game series that likes to stick to what it knows best. This further added to the attraction of the game as this was something the Soul series has never done before. However, one of these decisions, being the history and culture surrounding the game, will become an issue. To explain why, we need to recap that intro again with the proper context. As I said, this game takes place in the Sengoku era of Japan, which was a real time period in Japan's history. It was an over 100 year conflict that started because the shogunate at the time was losing influence. This then caused many of the local lords to vie for power and attempt to dismantle all the other lords and even overtake the shogunate. The main purpose was to eventually unify all of Japan under one rule, and after the final battle, called the Siege of Osaka, Japan was eventually unified under the rule of Tokugawa Ieyasu. Relating this back to Sekiro, that's why the first line in the game Japan was consumed by perpetual conflict makes sense as that matches with the current time period. The Sengoku era and what transpires within it also brings context to what's going on in the game. Japan is still under siege and judging from the use of guns and the lore of Ashina, it seems that we're entering the final years of the conflict. That means Ashina Castle is either one of or the only place left not fully unified under Japan. The question though is how is this possible? Well one of these reasons is integral to the main plot which is immortality but we'll circle back to that later as the other reason was Ishin. Ashina is already incredibly strong because of its generals, but Ishin was on a whole nother level. Considering the fact that Ishin is probably in his 70s or 80s in a profession with a very low survival rate, the fact that he is alive at all is quite terrifying. Especially when you consider that because Wolf was a child during this battle, Ishin has to be around 50 years old and was able to single-handedly take down the enemy faction's general. 
So obviously it's quite clear that Sekiro decided to utilize a very important time period in Japan's history as the backdrop for its story. And while I do like this approach, there is an issue. Because of the history of this game, it can be very hard to understand what it's trying to say. Sekiro is a Japanese game made by a Japanese developer, and since the game contains material they're familiar with, they're free to go as in-depth as possible to create an accurate story. And while that's great for the Japanese audience, this can confuse and damper a bit of the experience for everyone else. However, while I did call this an issue, it's really hard to complain about this decision, as it's not really something you can say is inherently bad, more just unfortunate. Playing Sekiro and trying to connect this game to Japan's history is like a Japanese audience playing Assassin's Creed 3 and connecting that game to America's history. The games are fine on their own, but the problem of course is when one group tries to play the other. For an example, we can take the cherry blossom trees in Japan, the ones with the pink petals. This tree represents new beginnings, good fortune, and revival, which is why these pink petals appear when we revive in game. Without looking into this information, you could just assume that they were just visual effects without any real meaning, but within their culture, there's a reason for this. Just like I said before, on its own, it's not a big deal, but it can be quite troublesome when you have to juggle the meaning of the cherry blossom trees along with all the other references. Like why the devs chose to have giant snakes and dragons be these large creatures as opposed to any other animal, why this game has a fascination with centipedes, and even just the basic ideas of Buddhism. To understand every single detail and reference in Sekiro, you will need to have lots of extensive knowledge outside of the game, but as someone who doesn't, I can say with certainty that the only real info you need to learn is the history I summarized regarding the Sengoku period. Everything else is nice and definitely really interesting to look into if you're passionate about the history of Japan and how it ties into Sekiro, but I don't think it's necessary to understand the story this game is really trying to tell. As we discussed earlier, our objective is to rescue the Divine Heir from Genichiro. The problem is that he's all the way at the top of Ashina Castle. And while the journey to Gidkuro is very engaging thanks to the combat, for the purposes of this video it does get a little boring. Sekiro, like many games, has certain parts where the gameplay is at the forefront. This is because the game is trying to familiarize us with stealth, grapple, posture, and deflect mechanics that make up the core combat. So because of this, the story takes a backseat for a bit so we can understand these mechanics. It's not an issue, and it's something I never complain about, it just makes it discussing the story of a game a bit difficult when the next 5-6 to six hours we don't make a whole lot of progress. So before we get to the castle, let's take a step back and talk about the game itself. Sekiro is a very gorgeous game, and the level design and exploration is quite linear compared to other Souls games. As while some areas do connect to one another, it's not as intricate as the Souls trilogy with its shortcuts and branching pathways. However, I still firmly believe the intention of this game was to create a different take on the gameplay and storytelling, so I don't mind its linearity, and even if that wasn't the intended purpose, a game being linear doesn't make it bad. And Sekiro just goes to show that a Souls game can be very linear and still provide an enjoyable experience. It's during this exploration, though, that we are introduced to our base of operations, as well as some NPCs that we'll be meeting quite a bit. The dilapidated temple is definitely one of my favorite locations, because I love the area's seclusion and also how it fits into the world very seamlessly. The past Souls games did this very well, with the Firelink Shrine from Dark Souls 1 being a highlight, but recently the series has started delving into this idea that the base of operations should be separate from the main content, like the Hunter's Dream or the Round Table Hold. In Sekiro, though, instead of teleporting from the base of operations to a spot on the map, you could just simply walk out the front gate and start exploring. It's a small detail, but I really enjoyed that about the dilapidated temple. Within the temple are three NPCs that we'll get to know throughout the game, who are the sculptor, the man who saved us and is responsible for creating and upgrading our prosthetic tool, Emma who's a doctor that serves under Lord Ishin and will also upgrade our gourd, and Hanbei who is a target dummy who can't die due to some form of immortality. Minus the three of the dilapidated temple and some of the others that are more related to the story, the game also has some optional NPCs we can talk to, but it's definitely not one of Sekiro's strong suits. A lot of the optional NPCs seem to only be placed in the world for one specific reason, like this one dying soldier who warns us of the enemy ahead, or this monk who found his way into the Halls of Illusion and has no plans of leaving. That's literally their entire character. Probably the only interesting NPC in this game is Jin Zaymon, this random warrior that patrols the outskirts of Ashina who is entranced by some music that he can only hear. We end up following him throughout the game until we find him gravely injured near this apparition called Lady Oren. She asks us about this Lord Sakuza and if we've seen him before, and seeing as we have no clue who that is, we tell her no, but she gets angry and claims that we're lying to her. After defeating Owen, it seems like her mind has gained some sort of clarity as she seems happy to die as she can now be with Lord Sakuza, implying that this Sakuza along with her are both dead. But the reason she's still here is because her spirit couldn't pass on, so we kind of help her continue into the afterlife. Once we talk with Jizaemon again, he gives us a Jizo statue, and from this dialogue in the item description, it seems to imply that he was related to Oren and Sakuza and was possibly the couple's son. Apparently this may also be related to a popular Japanese ghost story, which once again further adds to the beauty of this questline. 
Jinzaemon is one of the few NPCs in this game with an actual questline and is by far the best at it. Another NPC that I definitely took a liking to was Kotaro, but not because of a questline, but more just because he's a really sweet kid and it's kind of hard to hate him. But while Jizaemon's quest was great, it was a little bittersweet, as it makes me wish that they could apply this same effort to other characters and not have this overabundance of NPCs and merchants that don't really say anything but one line. Getting back to the story, while progressing through the Ashina outskirts, you may stumble upon these ghost figures, which are actually just remnants of Lord Kuro. This remnant is specifically important, as it's a conversation between Genichiro and Kuro, who talks about the inner ministry, and how they were able to drive them back once, but their army is too powerful. This is why Genichiro wants Kuro, because he knows that Ashina can't be defended by normal means. But what does he mean by this? Well, Lord Kuro is part of a divine lineage that is related to the divine dragon, and this lineage gives Kuro the power of the dragon's heritage, which is immortality. This is why Genichiro wants Kuro. He wants to gain the power of the dragon's heritage through Lord Kuro so that he can be immortal and prevent Ashina from being taken over. This not only gives us a hint of the events to come as it briefly mentions the interior ministry, but also lets us learn a bit more about Genichiro. We'll end up seeing more of him later, but Genichiro might be my favorite character in this whole game, as his backstory and motivation fits so well together. According to some item descriptions related to Gadichiro, we discover that he was taken in by Ashina when his mother died, so he's extremely grateful for the people that live here. So much so that he sees them as his extended family, so when the country of his people is under attack, he'll do anything he can to save them, even if it means using heretical arts. The description is both cryptic and informative, as it shows that he's willing to go as far as possible to defend Ashina, but we don't know what those heretical arts are. This is also probably a good time to mention the item descriptions, as just like previous games, some of Sekiro's lore is discovered via item descriptions. Main bosses will drop memories, which when consumed for attack power turn into remnants. The remnants are where the heart of the stories are, and while for some they don't provide too much information, for most of the bosses it's definitely enough to get an idea of who they were. Thanks to its accessible story and access to the remnants, you can get a large amount of the story just from these two sources, and it continues to reinforce that this difference in storytelling was a bold but fantastic choice. Right next to the remnant of Genichiro and Kuro is a large battlefield, which also happens to be the arena for the first boss, Gyobu Masataka Oniwa. I never mentioned this before, but Sekiro can be played in Japanese with English subtitles. This is similar to Ghost of Tsushima, which I believe also has the same feature. In the rare case that a game will offer me this option, I usually take the original language as I feel it's authentic, as I normally have subtitles on anyway, but if there was ever a reason to play this game in English, it's this intro. My name is Kyobu Masataka Oniwa! As I breathe, you will not pass the castle gate! It is so over the top and absurd that I couldn't help but laugh, and it kind of speaks to Gyobu's character. Gyobu was a leader of a group of bandits, but when they came face to face with Ishin, they were easily defeated. However, during their fight, Ishin noticed his determination and skill, so he would decide to take him in as an Ashina warrior. Gyobu really values strength over everything, and that's why he has this aggressive demeanor when he attacks us because he knows he's powerful and he can portray that to us. Interestingly enough, the spear that he uses also seems to be the same spear that General Tamura used during his battle with Ishin, which is quite poetic. And that also brings up a good point, and it's something I really appreciate about this game, and it's how wonderful and detailed the presentation is. A good example is the minor details that occur throughout the game, such as Tamura's spear, which is used by Gyobu, and then will eventually be used by Ishin later in the game. Furthermore, when we challenge Genichiro again, we're able to see Wolf's growth as a shinobi, as he pulls out the sword with ease, whereas in the intro, we can see him fumbling with the hilt. There are also the similar circumstances between the Sculptor and Wolf, who were both fighters that had their arms removed. The Sculptor had his removed by Ishin, whereas Wolf had his removed by Genichiro. We have two unrelated people who became a team, cutting off the limbs of two unrelated people who became a team. Interesting. This even extends to the cutscenes before the fights, especially the one with Genichiro again, which takes place in this beautiful land of flowers, and the camera angle specifically positions him to the side so the full length of his sword along with the moon is shown in the scene. Speaking of Genichiro, we can now talk about his boss fight. After defeating Gyobu and the Blazing Bull, you're presented with this tower along with numerous other buildings attached to it. This is the heart of Ashina Castle, and Genichiro is at the top. Assuming you make it to the top, you'll be greeted by Emma, Kuro, and Genichiro. He's still trying to get Kuro's powers, but he won't budge. That's when we step in and attempt to save him. I like the stakes of this fight, as not only is it a rematch between Wolf and Genichiro, it's a rematch between him and us. We finally get to get payback for him cutting off our arm, but Genichiro came prepared. 
He's still a competent fighter and could definitely be the first wall players will run into, but just when you think you've finally beaten him, Genichiro proves that he's willing to do whatever it takes to save Ashina and fights using the way of Tomoe, which means he's going to throw lightning at us. Thankfully, we learned lightning reversal just before this fight and can send it back to him, but I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't shocked when this happened. One thing I noticed as well was the black marks on his body. You could just play these off as wounds, but I think these are from the lightning powers of his, as maybe it's trying to convey that Genichiro harmed himself when attempting to control lightning for the first time. Regardless, it's a nice detail, but what's even better is the name, the Way of Tomoe. Tomoe is an unknown character at this point in time, and we'll talk about her a bit later towards the end, but I really love how they connected her and Genichiro, as Tomoe was his master and he learned the lightning attacks from her, which is interesting as the only other people able to conjure lightning in this game are the Okami women at the Fountainhead Palace. Plus, they can also do a move called the Floating Passage, which is a skill that we can learn, which is also the same move that Genichiro does to us, meaning he was trained by Tomoe, who is an Okami woman. As I said it doesn't mean much now, but once we learn a bit more about them, you'll come to appreciate the parallels between them and how well this was conveyed to us. It's similar to how Bloodborne had to rely on context clues in the environment to convey certain parts of the story, such as the backstory of the One Reborn being connected to Yahar Ghul, and I really love how this was integrated again. Eventually though, we will defeat Genichiro and rescue Kuro, but he's still not done. For now, he leaves, but not only will we see him again later, the way of Tomoe wasn't even close to his full arsenal, as that resurrection is a part of his next surprise, the Rejuvenating waters. I think it's been long enough, so let's talk about the elephant in the room, that being this game's obsession with immortality. Both Kadichiro and Kuro are immortal, but there are two others that we know about, that being Hanbei and Wolf, who are also immortal. Resurrecting isn't just a gameplay mechanic, it's a genuine part of the story. There are various different forms of immortality, or more accurately for some of them, body-altering methods within Sekiro. The first is the Dragon's Heritage, which is created with someone of divine blood like Lord Kuro. He also has the power to give people immortality through what's called the Immortal Oath. That's why we're able to live, because Kuro gave Wolf his blood during the Hirata estate attack, something I'll mention later. This is the purest form of immortality because it comes from the Divine Dragon and is very easy to acquire, but it comes at a price. If someone has the Dragon's Heritage, their blood stagnates, as they can never die. However, should someone with the Dragon's Heritage die enough times, then that blood overflows and creates a disease called Dragon Rot. Remember, you can still die with the Dragon's Heritage inside you, but you can't fully die, you just resurrect soon after. When we die, our blood stagnates, and if we keep dying, then the disease will spread. This Dragon Rot disease has a chance of affecting the NPCs throughout the game, although to be honest, this never really became an issue for me, as most of the people who were affected were merchants, and yes, while it does have the chance of completely halting NPC quest lines, I've never had this happen, but maybe I just got lucky. Our next immortality has to do with the Divine Child of Rejuvenation. She becomes relevant in the story after the fight with Genichiro, but she has what we can call False Dragon's Heritage. That's because the monks at the Senpo Temple became enthralled by the concept of immortality, so much so that they devoted every waking minute to try and perfect it. They even attempted to use children in their experiments to see if they could create their version of the Dragon's Heritage. Kotaro was the caretaker for these kids, and is sad because all the kids have left him. The reason they left, though, is because they died. If these statues and pinwheels are meant to symbolize each child, then a lot of them have passed away from this. In fact, we can meet a parent of the kids here at the temple. Brother! The Armored Warrior is a European soldier who came to Japan because of these rejuvenating waters and the promise of fixing this illness, but that ended up not working. Across the temple are these red and white pinwheels that are for the children who died, but there's one pure white pinwheel that represents the only survivor of the experiments who is the divine child of rejuvenation. As I said, she's the only one to have survived, and even though she's happy to be alive, she detests the monks that did this to her and her friends. The child, however, is in the Inner Sanctum, an area that is only accessed once we beat the folding screen monkeys in the Halls of Illusion, which according to some item descriptions, is a place that exists between the planes of life and death, implying that this is a spiritual plane that can only be accessed by a select few. The only ones able to access this place are Kotaro, this random monk, and us. It's possible though that if someone is infested, they may not be allowed to enter, and by infested, I mean the centipedes we see everywhere. The monks of the Senpo Temple, and even some other notable enemies like the Guardian Ape and the Corrupted Monk, are seen covered in centipedes, and the centipedes seem to make them immortal. We don't know why, but they just do for some reason. But there's a key distinction between this and Kuro's power. Whereas Kuro's power allows one to resurrect, the centipede prevents the host from dying at all. They can never resurrect because they're never going to die in the first place. 
There are two books we can find in the game called The Holy Chapter Infested and The Holy Chapter Dragon's Return that seem to infer that the High Priest of Senpo Temple was blessed by the centipede, and that because it had become one with him, he was able to walk the path of immortality, but he wanted to find out why. However, it seems like he was never able to find an answer. What we can assume, though, is that the centipede possibly came from the rejuvenating waters, which could explain their ability to make their host immortal as the guardian ape is located near the Lotus of the Palace, a flower that, according to its description, is near the palace waters, and the corrupted monk is guarding the palace itself, which is obviously surrounded by its water. Which then leads us to our final method of immortality, which is the rejuvenating waters. However, earlier I said body-altering method, not necessarily immortality, because the rejuvenating waters don't seem to make people immortal. The rejuvenating waters came from the divine dragon when it entered the land of Japan ages ago. It then expelled this water across the land. The water originally started in a place called the Fountainhead Palace, but then would make it eventually to Mibu Village. Currently, the theory I have is that the distance of the water relative to the source is important, as I think the farther it travels, the fewer side effects occur. As within the Fountainhead Palace, we can find these carp-like nobles who patrol the area, whereas in Mibu Village, they're still semi-human. We do know that the water started at Fountainhead Palace and did make its way to Mibu Village, but it seems like the villagers didn't know of its origin and its side effects. As from what we can gather, the town mayor treated the villagers to tons of sake one night, but when you drink sake, you obviously get really thirsty, and since they ran out, they had to resort to drinking water from the stream, but then the side effects kicked in, turning them into these semi-zombie type humans. However, all the inhabitants of both locations can die when we kill them, so it doesn't seem to make them immortal, maybe just prolong their life or grant them some resistances. The only character who doesn't fit into this equation is Genichiro, as he clearly resurrects. Wolf even says it himself, confirming that we did kill Genichiro at this point, but the waters brought him back to life. So how is this possible? Rejuvenating sediment. That's what we call a particularly concentrated part of the rejuvenating waters. I'm sure you saw it for yourself. The rejuvenating sediment grants great resilience in one's flesh. One becomes able to withstand blows that would be fatal to anyone else. So it seems that Genichiro consumed the rejuvenating sediment instead of the rejuvenating waters, which is why he reacted to it differently than those at Mibu Village. So, as a recap, we have the purest form of immortality, that being the dragon's heritage within Kuro, the unexpected immortality of the centipedes, the child of rejuvenation who was created as a way for the Senpo Temple to make a false dragon's heritage, and then the rejuvenating waters and sediment that seem to grant resistances and possibly a prolonged life when ingested. So the next question you might be asking is, why is this important? Well, once again, it all leads back to Lord Kuro. Kuro, being the divine heir with the dragon's heritage, wants to sever his ties to his immortality, as he's seen the effects it has on people and does not wish for this power to be used by anyone. Remember when the story used to be about rescuing a child? Well, now it's about immortality. This is very similar to Bloodborne storytelling, where it hides the true story until the halfway point of the game. I think Bloodborne did this much better, as that was intended to be a major plot twist, but I can't deny that Sekiro has succeeded quite well in doing the same. As I said earlier, Sekiro's story is very simple. Save Lord Kuro, then sever his ties of immortality. But when you jump down the rabbit hole of Sekiro, you realize just how deep it truly goes, and that without a doubt definitely deserves some recognition. So we have our new goal, but where do we start? We'll do some dialogue with both Kuro and Emma, we discover what items we specifically need. These items also tie into the game's endings, which I really liked as for once I knew what the items were, why they were important, and what ending they are required for, which made me even more invested in the story. While some of these items are only for specific endings, each one of them requires two necessary items, that being the Mortal Blade and the Divine Dragon Tears. The Mortal Blade can be given to us by the Child of Rejuvenation, who claims that everyone who's picked up this weapon has died, which is not an issue because we can't die. The Mortal Blade is important as the actual blade itself can kill those who cannot die, meaning we can sever Kuro's immortality. However, if you're puzzled by that description, then you and Emma have caught on to Kuro's plan. Wolf is extremely loyal to Kuro, and without him, he would have no purpose. So if he were to tell Wolf to sever his ties by killing him, he probably wouldn't go through with it. So Emma and Wolf devise a plan and try to prevent this from happening. However, this isn't good news either. Emma talks with the sculptor and also finds some notes written by Tomoe, the girl we talked about earlier, and discovers that to sever the ties of immortality while keeping the master alive, the one who has the blood must die. So now we're at a crossroads. We either sever the ties of immortality by killing Kuro, obviously not a good choice, or we kill ourselves and allow Kuro to live. Also, not a good choice. But there is a third option. Through some discussion with the Divine Child of Rejuvenation, we discover that it's possible to sever the ties of immortality by sending the Divine Dragon back to where it came from, allowing both Kuro and Wolf to live while also forcing the dragon to return home. 
This also ties into the second item we need, which is the Divine Dragon Tears, which are just simply tears from the Divine Dragon, which is necessary for the ritual, meaning we somehow have to get to this Divine Realm. So those are our three options. Each one requires specific items for the ritual to work properly, so it's on the player to find these items, then do the ending they want. I know it sounds like we skipped really far ahead in the story, but now that we've hit the halfway point, the game really focuses on the Severance ritual that we must perform, but it's on the entire focus. I said earlier that the remnant of Genichiro and Kuro was a foreshadowing of the events to come, and it's during these next few hours when Wolf scavenges the land for the required items that this will occur. After returning to Ashina with the Shelter Stone and one of the items we need for the ritual, we'll notice that something's wrong. All the fast travel points are gone, and by making our way back to Ashina, we discover that the Central Forces have started their assault. The Central Forces are the samurai dressed in red, with the purple soldiers being the most elite group called the Interior Ministry. Remember, Sekiro takes place at the end of the Sengoku era, so it can be assumed that the Central Forces are trying to take over Ashina so that they may unify Japan under their banner, and if that wasn't bad enough, an old relative makes his appearance. What are you plotting, Al? Plotting. I would do no such thing. Owl has returned, and he's here for one reason, Kuro. See, Owl's been plotting something for years and has been using Wolf this entire time. Owl, just like Anichiro, wants the blood of Kuro. Owl wants to be immortal. In order for him to do this, he'll need a foolproof plan. Firstly, he needs someone who can get close to him. That someone would be Wolf. How was he certain that Wolf was going to follow him? Well, he saved him from when he was young and became his father figure over the years. He also instilled the Iron Code within Wolf, something that he wanted him to live by just in case he needed to use it. As I said before, the Iron Code states that the father's word is absolute, with the master's being second. So with that in mind, it makes sense why Owl wants Wolf to follow the rules of the code so that Owl can enact his plan. The question that remains is where has Owl been? Well, very early in the game, you'll be given a bell charm by an old lady. By taking this to the Buddha statue at the temple, you can relive a memory from the Harada estate. There's also another bell charm that you can find that belongs to Owl, which will also take us to the Harada estate. The Harada estate memory was three years in the past, and it allows us to see the events of a very important time in Sekiro's story. Except an issue will arise from both the bells, as it's that both of them showcase the events of the Harada estate, but either have wrong information or it's in the wrong order. For example, the end boss of the first memory is Lady Butterfly, who we kill, but in the second memory, it's Owl, who we also kill. The second one is clearly wrong, as if we killed Owl in the past, he wouldn't be here in the present. So to do this properly, we're gonna have to jump between both memories to get the real truth. So three years ago, Wolf was sent out on some mission. It's unclear by who, but we can assume it was Owl. When Wolf returns, he finds the estate in flames. Apparently, some bandits took it upon themselves to burn the estate down, kill the villagers, and rob the place clean. The reason this attack worked so well is because many of the estate's guards were out fighting the wars happening near Ashino. The timing of this attack seems too perfect, and some of the villagers think so as well. You were nowhere to be seen when things went south. Wait, tell me you didn't lead them here yourself. The timing of their attack was perfect. Normally those bandits wouldn't have stood a chance. Yes. Yes, it had to be you. I hope you die, traitor. I wouldn't go that far, but he's definitely correct though that the timing was way too perfect. Wolf's main goal as the shinobi of the divine heir is to find Kuro and make sure he's safe. On the way there though, he will encounter Owl who seems to be gravely wounded and will pass away due to his injuries. We continue on and find Lord Kuro, except Lady Butterfly stops us from leaving. This encounter is interesting, as Lady Butterfly was Wolf's mentor, so why is she attacking us? My growing theory is that she's either working with Owl or at the very least betraying Ashina. Before her boss fight, we see this old lady trembling in fear, who happens to be the same old lady who gives us the bell. Further down the hallway is her son Inosuke, who we can also find in the present, and apparently was injured and rendered blind by Lady Butterfly. I can't imagine Inosuke was betraying the Ashina, meaning him and Lady Butterfly should have been allies, so this leads me to believe that she was betraying the Ashina along with Owl. Now whether or not they were working together or just had a common goal is never stated, but I also believe there's an answer to this. After defeating Lady Butterfly, Wolf gets stabbed in the back. There is no doubt in my mind that this was Owl, which means that not only was he faking his injuries, it's possible he was injured by Lady Butterfly, and upon discovering that we are here at the estate, he gives us the key to the fort where Kuro is hiding with the hope that we'll fight her. If we win, then he gets to stab us. If we lose, well, he'll have to fight her again, but given how much damage we did to her, assuming you actually did damage to her, then Owl would have an easier time putting her down. He basically wants us to fight her and then third party the winner so the Divine Heir can be his. From this information, we can also assume that he sent us away on a mission so that the Divine Heir was unguarded, as remember the timing was almost too perfect. After getting stabbed, Kuro sees Wolf dying and recognizes the bravery he possesses and gives him his blood. This moment is why Wolf can resurrect. But that was just one memory. The other memory will tell the real story. 
We learn from Owl's Bell Charm that the Interior Ministry was a part of the attack as well. The first memory will also provide you with a hint to the real story, as we can fight an Interior Ministry soldier in that memory, except there's only one. Furthermore, we learn from an eavesdrop conversation between Juzo and a soldier from the Ministry that Owl was behind the attack. That's why everything works so well. Owl being a shinobi of the Ashina would know the troop movements and knew when to strike. As for why Owl joined forces with the Ministry, it's because I believe they had aligned goals. Owl wanted the Divine Heir and the Interior Ministry wanted to defeat the Ashina clan, and a huge blow to their forces would be the Hirata Estate. Neither cared about the other's goals, but the two realized that by attacking the estate together, they could both get what they wanted, so they became allies. So now we have to ask, how do the bells work? So this involves some magical elements, as it seems that Wolf is physically in these memories, as not only does he keep his prosthetic, after talking with one of the Ashina Shinobi, he comments on the attack. The Dragon Spring Pilgrimage? That was three years ago. What is this? The sculptor mentioned an old memory. I don't remember any of this, but it appears this is the past. There is many times throughout the game that this knight gets brought up, but Wolf seems to have no memory of this moment. This to me means that Wolf is physically in the memory. Now, maybe in real life he's just getting images of the memory as we can see him kneeling before the statue, but because this is a video game, we're given control and able to play through it, so it's not entirely clear. But what is more important though is who the bells belong to, that being Inosuke's mother and Owl. The memories are sort of a point of view of the holder. That's why we don't see the interior ministry in the first memory, as to the old lady's knowledge it was just the bandits who raided the estate, as the Ministry used the bandits to mask their own attacks that the blame was put on the bandits and not them. Owl's Bell will obviously have more of the real story since he was present during the attack, but we still have some more questions to answer. Why do we fight Owl at the end of the second memory, and what happens after this event? Well, as for the first question, we seem to get the information from the sculptor. According to what he said, it seems that the Buddha statue was able to awaken old memories, along with the emotions and memories the person ringing the bell had. To me, the reason we fight Owl is so that Wolf can come to terms with his father's betrayal. Not just at the estate, but later when we get back to the present, as this charm is only found afterwards. Buddha is allowing him to let out his emotions through the only way the two know how. It's not a definitive answer, but that's what I've interpreted from this. As for our final question, well, we know the answer already. The aftermath of the memory is the intro. It seems that while the plan worked, Owl was unsuccessful in taking Kuro, maybe due to the temple caving in, or maybe because Kuro managed to escape. Either way, Owl was unable to find him. But seeing as Wolf is now the only one alive thanks to being resurrected from the dragon's heritage and is now next to the corpse of Lady Butterfly, he was framed for the attack and thrown in jail. This, of course, relates to the first conversation we hear in the intro. That shinobi at the bottom of the well. We didn't shackle him, restrain him, nothing. That doesn't worry anybody? Not at all. Not only is he unarmed, he has completely lost his will to live. Nothing but a coward. Unworthy of our concern. Wolf was tossed away, and seeing as he had lost his purpose along with his weapon, they didn't bother restraining him as it was unnecessary. So basically, Owl, with the assistance of the Interior Ministry, attacked the Harada Estate, using the bandits as cover to mask the truth of the invasion, so that the Ministry can get a staggering blow into Ashida's forces, and Owl can take the Divine Heir. However, things went wrong, and Owl couldn't take him, but he wasn't going to give up that easily. Owl then appears three years later in front of Kuro, who just outright tells him that he wants his Divine Blood. Wolf then arrives and Owl decides to enact the plan. He attempts to persuade Wolf in joining him by using the Iron Code and reminding him that he has to obey his father's word. Should he agree, this will lead to the first ending in the game, but we'll save that for later, as the true choice is to betray the code. Remember how I said the presentations of these fights were breathtaking? I can't tell you how hyped this made me. I was already hooked by the game to begin with, but this one scene had me completely invested in the fight. Owl isn't my favorite boss, as that one is specifically held for someone towards the end, but he's definitely a close second. The Souls games have always tried to add variety in their boss encounters. Sometimes they have these large, slow moves as opposed to fast, consistent swings, but other times they have unique gimmicks. The issue with Sekiro is that it's hard to pull this off when the combat is based around one weapon and one style of play. But it seems that From Software wanted to try this with Owl, and I think they succeeded. Throughout the game, we've been using our prosthetic to assist us in fights. It's incredibly powerful, and it's sometimes too powerful. With the introduction of Owl, we are now on the receiving end of that treatment, as he throws these balls that prevent us from healing, chucks dozens of shurikens at us, and even begs for mercy at one point just to throw a smoke bomb at our feet. He's a prick and doesn't play fair at all, but given that we've been doing the same the whole game, it's a humbling experience to be on the receiving end of it. Plus, we're now on an even playing field, as we have two skilled shinobi with an arsenal of tricks up their sleeve, which creates one of the best fights in this game. 
And the second encounter with Owl makes this all the better, as the Hirata estate is a great level. I like the idea of putting together the story through the context, clues, and conversation, as it retains that soul's formula of a cryptic story that the player is forced to figure out. My only gripe with this level is that this integral piece of story is completely optional. The old lady is an optional NPC, so you may never find her bell charm. Thankfully, Owls is an item the player can't miss, so they'll at least get one part of the Hirata estate, but the story of this level is confusing without both bells. Just like the story, I don't mind the player being forced to explore and uncover everything on their own, I just feel that something as important as the estate probably shouldn't have been optional. After we kill Owl, we can talk to Kuro and continue our duties. This is around the time where we discover the location of the Fountainhead Palace, as well as Kuro's plan to kill himself in order to sever his mortality, but we already talked about that earlier. The only reason I didn't wait until now to explain it, as it would have just been more confusing. So it's around this point in the game where we go to the Fountainhead Palace and attempt to find the Divine Dragon and the Ever Blossom Tree, or if we want to take a break from that, we can also gather the items for the other endings. But before we go on that journey, we can eavesdrop on Ishin and learn that not only will Genichiro return in the future, but he plans to bring the second mortal blade. This is huge news, as it's never mentioned that there is a second blade at all. I don't want to overload you with more info about that blade, so we'll talk about it when it's relevant at the ending, but do just remember that it does exist. Our journey to the Divine Dragon will take us to the Mibu village, where we're required to pray in a palaquin before being picked up by a giant straw doll who transports us to the Fountainhead Palace. I'll be honest with all of you. I don't got a single explanation for this. I don't know if this is something in Japanese culture, but I couldn't find a single thing. It's weird, and it's probably better if we just move on and act like that didn't just happen. Upon arriving, we encounter the defender of the palace, who is named the Corrupted Monk. Her backstory is that she was among the infested, which is why she has a centipede within her. But she doesn't seem to mind that, as she is the palace's guardian after all, so immortality would be quite fitting for someone like her. Here in the Fountainhead Palace is those carp-like nobles that drink the water, but there's also the Okami women. Sometime long ago, the Okami women discovered this palace, and even though the nobles got here first and don't appreciate visitors, they were fine with these warriors living with them as long as they became the palace's guardians. They agreed, and now the two live together surrounded by the rejuvenating waters. As we talked about earlier, Tomoe, the one who trained Genichiro was originally an Okami woman, as she was able to conjure lightning similar to how they can. However, this is where things get a little confusing. Though Tomoe served a Lord Takeru. Think of Wolf and Kuro's dynamic as the same thing as theirs. Takeru is Kuro, and Tomoe is Wolf. Just like our current duo, Takeru and Tomoe were trying to sever the ties of immortality, and majority of her notes detail their progress on the matter. These notes are actually how Wolf and Kuro realized that they needed the Mortal Blade in order for the severance to work properly, but if we find more of her notes, we can discover more of the story. One of them reads, Lord Takeru's coughs are worsening still. Returning to the Divine Realm is hopeless, and I only wish to sever the dragon's heritage and restore his humanity. So it seems that the two wanted to go back to the Divine Realm, implying that they had been there once before. On top of this information, we can also look at the lore descriptions of the Aromatic Branch, which is on Owl's body in the present, and the Aromatic Flower, which is on his body in the Hirata memory. From what I can gather, it seems that Lord Takeru is of the Divine Lineage, since Tomoe was trying to sever his ties of immortality, just like we are with Kuro. Furthermore, Lord Takeru possibly came from the Divine Realm, which would explain his Divine Blood. But looking over that note, it seems to imply that Tomoe also came from the Divine Realm, but it's never explained how that's possible. Once the two left the Divine Realm, Takeru would take a branch from the Everblossom Tree as a parting gift and would eventually plant it into Ashina to create an Everblossom Tree. We know this because Emma explains that Lord Takeru used to play the flute where we're standing while Tomoe would dance under the Everblossom Tree. However, it seems that the tree withered away despite that being impossible, and it seems it's because Owl took a branch from it, possibly because he believed this was required to obtain immortality. So the branch breaking thing sounds really weird so allow me to elaborate. I believe that Takeru took a branch from THE Everblossom Tree since it's located in the Divine Realm and we know that he lived there once before. He then planted the branch from that tree to make a smaller Everblossom Tree. Owl then took the branch from the smaller Everblossom Tree and then it of course withered away. So if the branch is able to destroy a smaller tree, what happened to the big one? Well, we can look at the Divine Dragon, as the full name of the boss is the Divine Dragon of the Everblossom Tree. When Takeru snapped a branch off the Everblossom Tree, that affected the Divine Dragon, which is why its arm is missing when we fight it. However, even after all their planning, it seems that the duo failed and both died. The reason for their failure is because they didn't have the Mortal Blade, but we do, so we can now succeed where they failed, but we still need those Dragon Tears. Just a reminder in case you forgot, we're fighting this dragon because we need to obtain the Divine Dragon Tears as it's necessary for the Severance Ritual. Even though there's not much in the arena itself, I really do like this set piece and it's very gorgeous. It's truly divine as the game intended it for it to be. This fight also segues into another positive about the game, and it's these final death blows. Death blows occur when the player has a full posture bar. For bosses, there are multiple death blows that the player must do to defeat them, but when it's the last bar, it becomes a final death blow. 
which is this added part at the end that ties the whole fight together. I love these death blows a lot. Sekiro's combat has always felt stylish to me, like it's a dance. The rest of the series has always been about dodging or blocking the enemy, and then when you succeed, do an attack of your own. In the beginning, you might be able to get away with this, but as you get deeper, many of the fights will have you moments away from broken posture for a total of five whole minutes, as if you give the boss any time to breathe, all that momentum is gone. Sekiro easily has the most intense combat in the Soul series, so it makes sense that you can end your stylish fight with a stylish finisher. You're able to breathe this sigh of relief knowing that you finally beat the boss, and while doing so, are able to watch this incredible cinematic that caps off the fight. After defeating the Divine Dragon, we cut open a slit under its eyes to extract its tears, and are now able to start the ritual. Except, we can't. According to Emma, the central forces have made it further into the castle and are right outside the gate. In order to avoid death, Kuro escaped and went to the secret passage, the same one we took in the intro. Emma also tells us that Lord Ishin has succumbed to his illness and has passed away. Honestly, before we continue, I gotta respect Ishin. We never talked about this, but after the fight with Giyobu, we'll meet with someone named Tengu. This person is Ishin, and judging by the corpse on the floor, he probably killed quite a few Ministry members even at his age. He was so strong that the only thing that could kill him was old age. He's got my respect for that. But now we have entered the finale, and while we should go to Kuro, we're gonna take a detour and return to the dilapidated temple as the sculptor is gone. Halfway through the game, the temple gets covered in these pieces of paper called Ofudas, and these papers can symbolize anything from a medium to allow people to communicate with deities through prayer or other things like finding safety or finding love. These papers, just like the remnant from earlier in the video, is a hint of what's to come. As we run through the battlefield, we'll come across a few burning structures, which isn't out of the ordinary, until we start seeing more and even and some claw marks around them. By interacting with the idol, we teleport and find the sculptor who has become the demon of hatred. The sculptor was a shinobi like Wolf who served under Ishin, and because being a shinobi means you're surrounded by killing, Ishin noticed that Shura was going to take over his body. Shura is basically when someone kills for the sake of killing. They don't have a reason for doing so other than the pleasure of taking another life. Fearing that the sculptor would succumb to this fate, Ishin cut off his arm, forcing him to retire from being a shinobi and temporarily halting Shura. The sculptor would also take up wood carving, as we can tell from the Buddha statues, as a way for him to keep his mind busy, but it wasn't enough as the flames of hatred were still burning inside him. And it was thanks to this war between the central forces and Ashina that caused him to succumb to the power. But because he was able to withhold it for so long, it was an incomplete version of Shura as a complete version of Shura, is what Wolf could have been. When we meet with Owl, we're given the choice of obeying or breaking the Iron Code. If we obey, we join forces with Owl. However, Emma and Ishin will attempt to stop us. In both of their fights, they mention the word Shura and how it's consuming Wolf. If we manage to defeat both Emma and Ishin, then we succeed and Owl joins us again, but it's too late. Shura has already consumed Wolf. So while Owl celebrates the victory, he gets stabbed the same way he stabbed Wolf. He is now a complete version of Shura. The sculptor was able to control his hatred for a long time, so that demonic version was only a partial amount of Shura, whereas Wolf has no intention of controlling it, and it happened immediately, so this is the full version of it. We then get to hear a short narration that states that a massacre had occurred shortly after this, and thousands of people had died. Wolf had completely lost it, and this is only the beginning, as he still has the blood of the Divine Dragon inside of him, so he's still immortal. But even if for some reason he did kill Kuro, and now doesn't have the resurrection ability, he now has a new weapon in his arsenal. When Owl returns, he came back with another sword, that is, the other mortal blade. So Wolf is possibly immortal, with two mortal blades and his prosthetic. He is never going to die. But how did Owl find the second mortal blade? Well, if we fast forward back to where we left off, when we try to escape with Kuro, we find Genichiro again, who has the black blade in his possession, meaning Owl took this from Genichiro. Huge credit, by the way, goes to Zuli the Witch for this, as I don't have access to a free cam mode on the Xbox, but if you use the free cam mode during the Shura ending, you'll notice that the object in Owl's hand when he approaches Wolf is Genichiro's head. He literally killed him, took the blade and his head, and then placed it next to his dead grandfather, which is extremely gruesome and definitely in line with the mood of the Shura ending. However, if we don't do that ending and instead disobey the code, then that leads to all the events we've covered so far, which brings us back to the flower garden against Genichiro. At this point, we face Genichiro so many times that he isn't that hard anymore, but there's no way Genichiro's going down without a fight. If we manage to kill him, he'll use the power of the Black Blade and summon Ishin the Sword Saint. There isn't much info on the Black Blade, but the item description of the Black Scrolls states, The Blade's name is Open Gate, and is said to hold the power or to open a gate to the underworld. It is through this power that it creates life. This blade 
and the Mortal Blade are opposites to one another. One blade can make the Undying die, and the other can revive those who are dead. As for the why, I think it's related to the Sword Saint's Remnant, which reads, One who returns from the Great Beyond does so at the peak of their prosperity. Ishin coveted strength and all manner of techniques through his mortal struggle. He wished for war until his final hour, and that is precisely what he got. This isn't the same Ishin that died at the castle. I think of it as a mindless version of him who just wants to fight. Going back to its name, Open Gate, that's why Genichiro slices his neck open as it's opening a portal to the Underworlds that Isha may come out and take over Genichiro while he sacrifices his life. At this point though, the reveals and constant appearance of Genichiro might be getting annoying and I can totally see that, but I have to disagree. Him showing up every time always meant something big was about to happen and he never disappointed. Plus it once again reinforces his personality. He is willing to do anything possible to save Ashina. He went from a standard samurai to conjuring lightning to using the black blade to then fully unleashing its power by resurrecting Ishin. If that's not determination, I don't know what is. Honestly, I can't even blame him for this decision. Resurrecting Ishin was a smart move as he kicked my ass for two straight hours. It takes everything you have to beat him, and I know many people may want to discuss how you have to fight him honorably, but we have to remember the way of the Ashina. The ways of the Ashina blade. It's our school of fighting. But there are no hard and fast rules. You just win your battles. That alone is the most important rule of the Ashina style. Who cares how we beat him? As long as you win, that's all that counts. Genichiro took this to heart, as we can see all the different ways he's attempted to beat us, and even Ishin does this as well, as he goes from a sword to a spear to using lightning to even using a gun at one point. Fighting Ishin literally took everything I learned up until this point to beat him, so it's fitting that after two hours of failure wasting all my healing on the first phase, I managed to beat him only using two gourds. There was only one move in the last phase that caused me to heal, and it was this lightning attack that I had this time. Besides that, just about everything else in this fight was flawless, and I couldn't have asked for a better conclusion. After Ishin is finished, we can now decide our ending, and on screen is the items that correlate with each of them. Ending 2 only requires the Dragon Tears. This sees us perform the Immortal Severance, meaning we take the Mortal Blade, kill Kuro, and fulfill his wish. With no master and no purpose, Wolf becomes the new sculptor. He's in a similar situation as the sculptor once was. He has no purpose anymore and has this burning sensation of killing taking over his body, so he attempts to quell the pain by carving statues. We can see that Emma joins us and becomes our permanent doctor, and also gives us our arm back as she says that we may need to give this to someone in the future. We learn when we get the prosthetic arm that this originally belonged to the sculptor who passed it down to Wolf, who is now going to pass it down to someone else. The Souls games have always had this theme of cycles like the Age of Fire or even the Hunter's Dream if we choose a specific ending, and this seems to be the same. In the future, some other person will stumble here with a cut-off arm and Wolf will pass it down to that person, and who knows, maybe Wolf will become the demon of hatred like the sculptor and will need to be put down by that new warrior. One thing that is confirmed is that he no longer has the power of the divine blood thanks to Kuro's death, and we know this because the white streak in his hair has gone back to its original color. For ending 3, we need the dragon tears and the aromatic flower which we got from fighting Owl in the Hirata memory. This is the other ending Emma and Wolf were looking into that involved Wolf sacrificing himself to make Kuro human again, just like how Tomoe wanted to make Takeru human again, but failed. It's a really sad ending, having to see our protagonist die like that. Even though it was a necessary sacrifice, it is still heartbreaking to see. We then get to see Emma and Kuro, and it seems that Kuro was leaving Ashina and will live his life as he should. Now that he is mortal and knows what it means to be human, he wants to live his life to the fullest while he can. Our final ending, which many consider to be the true ending of the game, sees us use the Divine Dragon Tears and the Frozen Tears, which is an item we get from the Divine Child of Rejuvenation. I'll be honest again, I can't explain what we did to get this ending, and I can't imagine someone doing this without a guide. It's it's like a 15 step process that requires you to find 5 different items with no indication on where they are. My personal gripes with that aside, Wolf will use the items on Kuro and carry him to the Divine Child, who then, for a lack of a better word, consumes him. She ends up becoming a cradle for the Divine Heir, which is something she talks about during that 15 step process, and it's why we go to her for this ending. She along with Wolf then set out to the Divine Dragon's birthplace in hopes of sending it back to where it came. Just like many of the series' secret endings, it's very confusing and doesn't really make a whole lot of sense as there's little to go off of. But it's possible that through this ritual, the Divine Dragon now lives inside Kuro, who is now inside the Divine Child, and can now be safely escorted back home. I'm not entirely sure if that's what's going on, but I would assume if the Dragon leaves Japan, then the rejuvenating waters would go with it, returning the land back to normal. I have the same opinion on this as I do the other game's secret endings, and that's while cool, I just never felt any impact from them, as they confuse me more than anything. It's hard to appreciate something that you don't understand, so if I had to choose an ending, I'd probably pick the Purification 
ending that has Wolf sacrificing himself. It's sad, but it feels complete. One thing that puzzles me though about these endings is the fate of Kuro, Emma, and Wolf. As we know, the central forces were invading Ashina, and there's no doubt that they won, as not only do they have the strength, weaponry, and numbers, it would also undermine the entire story if they failed. Which makes this all the more confusing, as you would think that this group would be hunted down. Maybe since they're not soldiers per se, they didn't bother fighting them, but as we can see from the destruction that was both caused at Ashina and Hirata, I don't think they possess some moral compass, so your guess is as good as mine. With the endings finished though, we've come to the end of Sekiro, and that's something I wish I didn't have to say just yet, as Sekiro does not have any DLC. There is the Gauntlets of Strength, but as for the story-related content, there is nothing. This is the first time since Demon Souls or one of the games didn't have a story DLC, and I find that quite upsetting. There is still tons of story that could have been explained, like the origins of Tomoe, or even the Central Forces, and it sucks that we'll most likely never see them again. Despite that though, Sekiro was such a different experience compared to the past Souls games in both gameplay and story, and while things did get a little bit complicated along the way, as a whole, the story was fantastic. It's got a barrier of entry that is low enough to where you actually understand what you're supposed to do and why, but it's also deep enough for those that want to know everything about the game. It's able to satisfy both crowds of players, and coming from a series where you're more than likely going to finish a playthrough without understanding a single thing that happened, that's very impressive and definitely deserves some recognition. Simply put, if you're a fan of the Souls games, go pick up Sekiro. You won't be disappointed. If you made it this far, then you made it to the outro, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then be sure to like and subscribe if you're new. Sekiro was a blast to play, but we're still not done yet. We have a lot more Souls content to get through, and I hope that you'll continue to join me on this journey through the series. While you wait for the next video, be sure to check out my story review on Bloodborne, as well as any other videos that may interest you if you haven't seen them. As always, thank you to my returning viewers for coming back, and with that, take care everyone. Goodbye.